Here we go. Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about autoimmunity and natural approaches to the immune imbalance that causes autoimmunity. And there are going to be many of those approaches as well as reasons that people can end up in an autoimmune state. So we're going to be going through those today. If you have questions, we'd like you guys to please put them into the chat area if you're comfortable with that, and we'll try to address them at the end of the talk because we have a lot to get through today. So there are three of us on the panel today. There's myself, Dr. Molly Force, Dr. Melinda Bauer, and Dr. Rosalie de Lambert. And we are all really excited to talk to you guys about our experiences in the autoimmune realm. And this is a very complex subject. So once again, please feel free to put um, your questions in that chat box and we'll try to get to those at the end. Also, this is being recorded so that you can go back and refer um, to this presentation. So let's jump in here. So what we see in regards to autoimmunity is we see a patient presenting to us as physicians that have many diagnoses and they have usually a whole host of physicians that have worked with them in the past. A lot of times they have had really a lot of challenges dealing with the symptoms that they have. They will be complaining of chronic illnesses that are not resolving. They seem a little bit typical. Maybe they're not resolving the way we would expect them to with certain medications. There's also quite a lot of variability. So what that means is my patient might come in and say, I was really great last week, but the week before I was in bed because I was in so much pain or I had such a bad you know, flare, but maybe they won't even identify it as a, what we call an autoimmune flare. Because a lot of these patients ultimately do not necessarily know that they have a form of autoimmunity. A lot of times the person might also present saying, hey, I've got this big stack of labs and nobody's been able to figure out what's going on. Here's my testing. Um, you know, I've worked with 15 or more doctors and we just don't know what's wrong. And so when I see a patient like that, my red flags are going off to really think about autoimmunity and multiple immune reactions. So the other piece, when we say multiple immune reactions, we're talking about having immune triggers that are responding to many, many, many different um, inputs. So that could be something like food or chemicals or infection. And we're going to go through a lot of those today. But essentially, what's really important to take away here is that a person may be walking around with an autoimmune condition, and they might not even know it. And a lot of times, those are the most complex people that we're working with as physicians. So these are some typical conditions that you, some of these you've probably heard of that are all within the autoimmune realm. So we have hyperthyroidism, diabetes, especially type one, although there's some newer information about that um, coming out, um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, arthritis, psoriasis, um, B12 anemia issues, gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, Meniere's disease, rosacea, um, non-viral hepatitis and interstitial societies. Just to give, just give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say autoimmune diseases. So autoimmunity is a production of your own antibodies uh, against something that's typically not a pathogen, right? So typically our immune system chimes in when there's a bacteria or a virus or a parasite or a fungus and mounts this reaction and we get typical symptoms. Maybe we get a fever, maybe we get some joint pain, flu-like symptoms, but with autoimmunity, the body will kind of mount a similar reaction to the own bodily cells. Um, and like Dr. Molly mentioned prior, a lot of things can trigger this sort of self reaction. Um, it can include things like genes, the way that your own immune system is, is specifically set up, uh, inflammatory things in, in the lifestyle, stress, uh, even hormonal changes, um, some epigenetic factors like environmental factors uh, do play into this um, and can lead to all sorts of different 
yeah, different uh, presentations in, in the body. So when we're thinking about autoimmunity, we really want to understand when a person comes in where they are in regards to this process. So that definition of the immune system tagging its own self tissues can present in three different stages. The first one, the patient has no symptoms. So you may have no symptoms, but be having a silent autoimmunity happening in the body where the tissues have been tagged. But in stage one, we have no symptoms. And this is because the tissue itself has not been destroyed enough to, to notice that. Stage two is called an autoimmune reactivity stage. And we have at that point the tagging of the tissue, but we don't have enough tissue damaged to really see it as physicians. So diagnosing it can be harder unless we're looking at just the blood work. And we're going to talk about that in a minute about looking at those antibody antigen reactions. And then the third stage, which is the classic one that a lot of patients will present at because they haven't been diagnosed earlier, we haven't caught it earlier, is the stage where a person is coming in with actual symptoms and we have actual tissue damage. And at that point, as you can imagine, once that tissue has been tagged for destruction and the immune system, which is very good at what it does, has attacked those cells, then we have permanent damage at that point. And that is a big deal because one of the pieces we want to be thinking about as we're working to rebalance the system is stopping that damage that's going on and keeping those tissues safe from further damage. So again, some common conditions that um, we refer to as autoimmune conditions. So we have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, lupins, Sjogren's disease, celiac, um, diabetes type one, which is the insulin um, required one, and type three, a newer type that we've been talking about. Um, rosacea, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and then the IBDs, the ulcerative colitis and the um, Crohn's disease. So this is an important slide because it talks about uh, specific sort of differentiation that happens in the immune system. Um, and where autoimmune arises has to do with uh, this, this step of differentiation. Um, and so, on the left-hand side, there's that innate immunity. It's kind of like all of the big immune cells that include your, your dendritic cells, your, your things known as antigen-presenting cells, the ones that sort of bring something up that they see that's weird and show it to the body and say, hey, look at this. Uh, it could be, like I said prior, a virus, a bacteria, but it could also be a piece of your own tissue that then the body kind of reacts to, right? Um, on the right-hand side is the adaptive immunity. This kind of takes a few days to kick in, uh, and it's, it's a cascade of events that makes very specialized cells that remember the virus or the bacteria or the, immune, uh, the autoimmune piece. Um, the, the piece of tissue that's been flagged. And these cells are the ones that remember for next time, for when it sees it again. And both of these in combination, in concert, kind of lead to, uh, you know, the autoimmune disease that happens further, further along in the pathology. So we wanted to make sure you guys understood kind of the basic what we would expect from a normal immune system. And so with that, understanding these players of that innate immunity, like Dr. Rosalie was just talking about, versus the adaptive immunity. Now with that, we see an activation of both sides when we have an autoimmune imbalance, but the initial trigger comes in in regards to that adaptive immunity. That's where our antigens and antibody system really comes into play. And so these antibodies are made against our own self tissues. And those self tissues are tagged as antigens or what we would think of as like a foreign invading protein. So we don't need to get too in depth with this, but we just wanted you guys to understand the general overview of how things are supposed to work because every single step in this 
circular uh, flow model here of the immune system for what should happen can go wrong to cause autoimmunity. So it can be really challenging to figure out what area started the immune event in regards to the breakdown in this process. But it's important that we understand the how this process works so that when we're trying to support the immune system, we can be thinking about each of these players. So when things go wrong, um, sometimes we'll notice that um, there's an immune imbalance and that's the, the main piece that tells us that something's going wrong. Um, when we see these um, these tissues of our own body, our self tissues tagged for destruction by antibodies, that's actually um, not supposed to be happening. So frequently when we're doing blood tests and we see um, antibodies to the thyroid or antibodies to other um, components of um, you know, and autoimmune diseases, we know that that's, that's an autoimmune process that's not supposed to be there. We also see um, in the world of loss of central tolerance and self tolerance, um, that's, um, part of the imbalance that we would that we would be looking for, as well as like Dr. Molly was talking earlier about the difference between the silent autoimmunity. So that's when things are starting to go wrong, but you don't quite yet see it yet, either with symptoms or sometimes even with blood work versus a full on autoimmune reactivity. Um, you know, though both of those, there are there are signals and clues all throughout that something may be going wrong. So these are overall all the kinds of different imbalances that we're looking for when um, when you know patients come in and they start talking about either signs and symptoms or labs that are a little bit off but not quite clear what's going on. These are the kinds of things that we're looking for. So in terms of how do we pick up uh, these autoimmune conditions? Well, there's several markers in the blood that kind of point us in the direction. Uh, generally, you know, your, part of your annual blood work includes something known as the CBC, which is the complete blood count. And it tells us about what the red and the white blood cells look like. Um, it also tells us about the platelets. So sometimes in autoimmunity, this can look a little strange. There might be, you know, we, we kind of look deeply into what the white blood cells look like and it divides it out into uh, all sorts of different white blood cells. And sometimes we can see them come back a little bit high, sometimes a little bit low. This sort of clues us in to do some further testing. Same thing with the CMP, the complete metabolic panel. This tells us about all of the organs in the body from you know the kidneys, uh, to your electrolyte balance, um, and it, that also can, can, you know, if the organs are getting involved, it can show up in that panel. Uh, and then when we sort of flag something as like, hmm, this looks a little weird, uh, we can go even deeper and sort of pick up on those specialized immune cells that the body has made and we can see them in their, these following tests, the ANA test, the specific uh, disease specific tests uh, that show us that there is an antibody to a specific tissue. Um, the ANA test is more a general test that looks at whether there is uh, anti autoimmune response and the rest of those talk about very specific autoimmune diseases. So when we're diagnosing autoimmunity for us as clinicians and especially as more functionally minded naturopathic physicians where we like to have evidence-based medicine, we really like to be able to find out what tissues are involved. And once my patient has made clear to me that they are in the autoimmune process, even at the beginning, when they're having silent autoimmunity, I want to know what tissues have been tagged. And can you see why that would be important? We want to practice preventative medicine whenever possible. So that knowledge is really power. It's really our understanding of what tissues do we need to preserve and what tissues do we need to really be looking out for over the course of the next year five years, 10 years in regards to tissue destruction. Because if it has to do with tagging, for example, 
the cells of the liver, then we can imagine that the person is going to have a harder time with their biotransformations of their hormones and with detoxifying their system, for example. So one of the tools that we use, which is a little different than our standard medical colleagues, is we will often use a specialized test which helps with understanding what tissues have been tagged. Now this is done with the same sort of science that you would see done by like LabCorp or Quest. It's the same antigen antibody reaction testing, but the antigens that they're using, which, which are testing for these antibodies within your body, these proteins are tissues that are not typically tested unless you're in some kind of clinical study. So I find this to be just a really awesome, helpful test, and I'll run it with a, a, quite a few of my autoimmune patients because it does 25 different tissue markers. And once again, getting, you know, getting even one single one of these done through one of our conventional labs can be very, very expensive or impossible even, like I said, unless you're in some kind of clinical study. So being able to know, has your heart tissue been tagged? Has your muscle tissues been tagged? What about your tendons? What about your liver? Um, this goes through your brain. I mean, we see the cerebellar and the synapse in here. So it, it really is a beautiful way to capture and say, oh my gosh, you know, this person is having issues with autoimmunity and they've already tagged these tissues. Because once those tissues have been tagged, that process is not reversible. This is a this is a chronic cascade that happens. Now we can decrease the immune system's response, but we can never truly turn it off. So these are the 25 markers, for example, that's in this specific test that's offered by this lab, Cyrex, that we run through our office. And like I was saying, it does all these different tissues, which are really hard to know about otherwise. So people with autoimmunity, a lot of times, they'll have one tissue marker come up, say they're diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, but we can expect that if the immune system has an imbalance, then other self tissues will likely either be mimicked or tagged as some kind of antigen, which is like attacking. And so it will start an autoimmunity to these other tissues. So that's why this is, can be a really powerful piece for us as, as preventative physicians. And I wanted to just reiterate what Dr. Molly just said, because I think it's really important. It's really common when a patient has one um, autoimmune process happening in one particular part of their body that they may actually develop another autoimmune process in a different part of their body. So for example, you know, if you're recently diagnosed with Hashimoto's and you're having a lot of sensitivity to gluten, we may actually test you to make sure you don't have celiac disease because that's a, another autoimmune process. And we know that once you have one process going, it's common to have other processes. So having a big picture like this is really helpful for us to make sure that we're appropriately treating all the different conditions. And that's not just something that we've figured out as naturopathic physicians. That's very well distinguished and established in the medical literature. There's hundreds of studies that show that once you have one form of autoimmunity, your propensity for getting others um, is much, much higher. So we talked a little bit about root causes and you know what are the triggers and what are these imbalances that lead to these autoimmune issues. And these are just some that, that we're always thinking of as naturopathic doctors. So obviously, you know, if you have a family history of a particular autoimmune disease, that genetic piece is part of your history now too. And that could be a, a, um, a root cause for why an autoimmune process might happen. Same with gender. We know that um, women are way more likely, I think two to three times more likely to get autoimmune diseases than men. And we know that the main difference between men and women, one of them <laughs> is hormones. So we know that there's a big, dish, a big issue with hormones and frequently we'll even see autoimmune issues happening with women with big hormone surges like with with um, adolescence or with pregnancy or with menopause, whenever we have these big changes in hormones. Um, obviously, if there's any tissue damage or inflammation or infection, those are going to all be reasons why the body might um, lean toward having an autoimmune type of response. And then toxins and pollutants are really big ones. So, you know, um, we might try as, as hard as we can to avoid um, toxins in our food and toxins in our water, but unfortunately we can't remove all the toxins from the air and all the toxins from, from our environment completely. 
Um, and it's really clear in the literature that a lot of um, environmental toxins are a big trigger for um, autoimmune conditions. Yeah, I like to think of it in general, you know, the body sees something it doesn't like, it sort of mounts an inflammation response and that stresses the body and, and the chronic progression of all of that leads, can lead to autoimmunity. Um, so, you know, how do we make sure that we're not, we're not filling our cup too much with, with these things can, that can cause stress inside our body? Um, so one of the things is if we've got a sluggish liver, we've got poor detoxification of, of the toxins we get in from our food, our environment. If our GI tract, if our stomach is not, uh, you know, digesting foods as well as it could, you know, due to poor microflora, uh, those, those digestive enzymes as well might be low in the, in the stomach. That can lead also to sort of filling our cup too much. Uh, if we're eating a diet low in antioxidants, kind of the standard American diet that doesn't, that isn't filled with the rainbow of colors, that's sort of lacking the blues, lacking the greens, uh, those antioxidants are protective against inflammation. And then general barrier breakdown, I mean, this could be in any of the tissues, but typically I guess we think in the GI tract when there is a leaky gut, for example, uh, when food particles are going through into the bloodstream, uh, that's when the body's like, wait, why is this here? And sort of flags it and that can start the autoimmune cascade. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to make sure that we are uh, ensuring that cup doesn't fill all the way up uh, and it includes, you know, clean, green cleaning supplies, the ones that don't contain uh, the hormone disruptive pieces, uh, including uh, removing plastics, uh, benzenes, car exhaust, cosmetics, formaldehyde glues. These are all things that, uh, you know, have been, have been talked about in the past as like toxins that can potentially um, get, bring us down that, that autoimmune uh, trajectory. Yes, exactly. So we know from the literature that all of those can cause that chemical imbalance. Those chemicals can push that autoimmune imbalance, sorry, um, from, from medical literature. So we want to stay away from those. So we do need to identify those imbalances, right? So as naturopathic physicians, once again, we're trying to look at the whole picture. So we say, what is it that may have caused the trigger? So we want to figure out what our root cause is. So we want to say, what are your risk factors? Other than, you know, are you a woman and did you have a genetic predisposition? We want to think about the things that we can really change. So that's lifestyle, that's looking at the chemical uh, triggers, and that's looking at the barrier breakdown. And we're going to go into each of these in a more detail here. In regards to lifestyle, of course, you guys all know that stress can lead to chronic inflammation and is one of the, the most silent of killers. So we think about that fight or flight response. We think about that sympathetic system, and that affects our ability to rest and digest. When we have that difficulty with digesting, then we have problems at the gut layer in regards to the food proteins that are gonna come through. We're not breaking down those proteins well enough and that can be problematic. And we know once again from that medical literature that those large glycoproteins especially that cross through that barrier, and we're gonna talk about this in detail here in a second because it's one of our favorite subjects as naturopaths, um, that can do significant damage and can cause an autoimmune reaction. So the other piece of course is sleep. Are you getting enough sleep? And remember with that comes that melatonin pathway which gives us antioxidants. We wanna be thinking about exercise. We know this induces something called the nitrous oxide pathway and we'll talk about that in a little bit too in regards to vasodilation and vasoconstriction and that helping with reducing autoimmunity. And then relationships. We know that there can be toxic relationships that can, I believe, cause such emotional trauma for people, then that can also cause an imbalance of the immune response. We also know, once again, these chemical triggers, like Dr. Rosalie was just talking about, how that they can affect our flora, our gut flora, and that imbalance can be very problematic. The chemical triggers can disrupt our hormones. We know this from plastics, for example, and how they are estrogen mimickers, and they can disrupt our thyroid function and our sex hormones. 
leading to things like infertility. And we know that there's even autoimmune infertility. And additionally, toxins in general that our bodies cannot flush out um, can trigger those immune responses because of the, the um, inflammation. Barrier breakdown we're going to get into in way more detail here in a second, but essentially we need to think about what is irritating the barrier system. And we're going to go through what the barriers are here in a second too, but we got to think about things like infection, toxin exposure like we were talking about with those chemicals, and then there are certain medications that can really trigger this as well, as well as food proteins. So these are just some of the barriers, like when we talk about a barrier, like what is what does that mean? So in general, we have the, the nasal passages as well as the lungs. That's one major barrier. Our intestines are a big barrier. We have this barrier that's supposed to protect our brain from things that aren't supposed to enter that. We have a barrier around our urinary system and then a barrier around our vaginal system. So you can see in each area. So when the nasal passage in the lungs, obviously anything that you breathe in could be a problem. So pollution, chemicals, tobacco, infections that come in through, um, through the nose and through the airways like COVID. Um, intestines, like this is a um, something that's going to be happening on the internal side. So again, if you're, if you're eating, um, if you're getting infections from food that you're eating, if there's a, a change or a, a shift in the, the normal good bacteria in the system, we call that dysbiosis. So that's a change in the barrier. Obviously chemicals or parasites are like what Dr. Rosalie was talking about. If you're eating foods that you're sensitive to and that they're, they're, um, they're creating inflammation that over time creates a disruption in the barrier and they get through those food proteins if they're not broken down into tiny little glucose and tiny little amino acids, the body's like, whoa, what is that? It must be a virus, I have to attack it. Um, same with yeast. So blood brain barrier, we obviously wanna protect um, the brain from um, certain things, especially chemicals and heavy metals, those do not live in the brain and they can create lots of problems. Um, and, and like all of these other barriers, um, that barrier, if it's disrupted, can create a lot of problems if those things get in. Same happens with the urinary barrier, same happens with the vaginal barrier. So you can see that all of these barriers, they have a very important purpose to keep these parts of our body in line and in balance and in health. And if there's a disruption and any of these things get in and, and disrupt that barrier, then that could lead to a triggered autoimmune reaction. So one of the major barriers that's uh, linked with autoimmunity is our GI tract. And specifically, you know, the first piece is the stomach where, you know, we take in the food, we've mechanically chewed it into these little particles. We uh, take it in and then the enzymes and the microflora, uh, well, the enzymes will do, do its work there to sort of break these food molecules into uh, yeah, their respective little sugar molecules, little protein molecules. Sometimes when there is inflammation in the gut, the barrier of the gut becomes leaky. So these square-like green uh, shapes are actually the cells of the gut lining, okay? And you can see that there's a space between them. And that's due to inflammation typically that sort of makes that space and allows those red stars, those food particles to go through and enter into the bloodstream. So that's unusual. And like we mentioned earlier, uh, the body flags these and says, hey, this is not typical, right? And then you can start a cascade where the flagging, the, the immune flagging becomes you know, over time, uh, an autoimmune thing, uh, an autoimmune condition. Lot of, a lot of things can cause leaky gut, uh, specifically the, yeah, there, there's many things I'm sure uh, we'll elaborate on this in, in a little bit. So when we're talking about intestinal permeability, some of the most common reasons that this happens is something called endotoxemia. And we can now test for this. And what that is, is essentially when the good flora, your microbes, when they stop being able to protect your body against 
immune reactions when they're digesting food or uh, sorry against toxins when you're digesting your foods so the foods themselves start to be seen as toxicants or toxins and it produces this immune complex it's called lps um, and so we can now test that which is really cool um, through actually saliva testing to see how um, high somebody's LPS level is. And if it's high, it means that there's a major problem with the flora, and usually it means that there's an infection. And a lot of times in my patients that I'm concerned are about autoimmunity causing caused by an infection, sometimes it can be a hidden infection or one that they haven't noticed. For example, uh, many times it's been a tooth infection that they didn't know about and it just was kind of bothering them, but it wasn't bothering them enough to go get it checked out quite yet. And that was causing this elevated LPS and this endotoxemia, and then the immune system gets dysregulated and starts tagging uh, food proteins that are leaking through the gut. Also, we know that with intestinal permeability, we have this chronic inflammation and the cells get damaged. And so the takeaway really here is, you know, we want you guys to do a scan of your body and think about your barrier systems and think about if there are some or many that may be affected. And we now have tests that will help us understand that, which is so cool. It's, it's new to me in my practice over the last five years. Um, and it, it really helps us understand what systems are really contributing to this autoimmunity. So as far as treatment strategies, you know, once we have an, a, an understanding of what tissues are being involved or what areas have been tagged, um, once we've identified particular irritants and obviously um, attempt to remove them depending on what they are, um, then we can actually, we can actually get to a, a place of cure. So, you know, is it an infection? Is it this dysbiosis where there's an imbalance in the GI tract? Is there some sort of source of chronic inflammation? Um, is there a potential food trigger like we've been talking about? So we wanna be balancing the floor. We wanna make sure that all these different barriers have all the support that they need. We always wanna be supporting digestion. We wanna make sure we're reducing any damaging proteins that are getting through if there is some kind of leaky gut. And these are just some of the ways that we would, um, we would start to work on um, treatment for a particular autoimmune patient. So a lot of ways to test for infection, one of those pieces that can contribute to autoimmunity. Uh, we can do a comprehensive stool panel that looks for parasites, bacteria, viruses, and yeasts, even like candida. Uh, the stool panels can sometimes also tell us about leaky gut. Uh, we can do an add-on test that looks at specifically uh, that the leaky gut proteins. Um, we could do some blood work to see if in the blood, is there an immune reaction or is there a presence of bacteria or viruses that are just hanging out longer than expected. I'm thinking of things like, you know, your EBV or your chronic mono picture um, that we could do, yeah, a lot of blood work to look, look at those. And then lastly, we can also do some salivary testing. Like Dr. Molly mentioned, we can look at that LPS, which is sort of a breakdown product of a, of a bacteria. Um, and that can clue us into, oh, there was an issue here, right? There was an infection. Um, and that we're sort of headed down the path of, yeah, the barriers are affected. So one of those triggers being dietary proteins. This is something that we can affect. This is something that we have some control over. And what we know from the literature is that dietary proteins absolutely can perform something called molecular mimicry. And this is a really important term that I want you guys to understand because what it essentially means is that there's a cross reactivity between a tissue and other food proteins because a portion of that protein looks the same to the immune system. So when we look at how that, um, that molecule looks, there's at least a chunk of it that's similar. And so like a key, that key can fit into the immune lock, if you will, and turn, turn the door and open the door to this chemical cascade. So we do not like molecular mimicry because it means that, for example, when you have the, 
grain, for example, like oats or something like that, the body might see that and be like, oh, that is just like this other infection that I saw this one time. Now I'm going to start this immune response. And I'm, I'm, out for, I'm out for figuring out what this is. I'm going to start tagging things around this protein that came in while the protein came in through your gut. And so maybe your, your gut tissues get tagged, for example. So we also know from the literature that proteins in foods are different if they're raw versus cooked. So we want to be thinking about when we're testing, are we testing just the raw foods? Are we testing the cooked foods? And then the same thing when people are eating it. Are they tolerating raw versus cooked better? And then we also have this confusion here that comes on in regards to foods, which has to do with the food proteins actually change when they're combined with other foods. So that makes it really challenging when we're trying to do these reintroductions for elimination diets, for example. And then we also know that there can be a direct immune response that happens to a food. And the classic example of this is celiac disease, where we know that there is an autoimmunity to the gluten that comes in itself, and that has been tagged, and then the tissues around it get destroyed by this inflammation that happens as a secondary response to the immune system being activated to that antigen, which is the gluten. So we wanted to talk just about a couple of autoimmune processes that you're probably familiar with. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is definitely the one that I see most commonly in my practice. And we know that this is damage or inflammation that's actually happening in the thyroid gland. So like what we've been talking about, the body is actually attacking the thyroid gland, assuming that it's a cancer or a, a virus or a bacteria or something that doesn't belong. Um, we know that when we have patients that have been diagnosed with hypothyroid, that's a low thyroid, that 80% of the, these cases frequently are associated with Hashimoto's. And um, we also know that, like we talked about with all autoimmune diseases, that this is more common in women. And frequently patients will come to us saying, yes, I have hypothyroidism or yes, I take thyroid medication, but they've actually never been tested for the actual thyroid antibodies, which is what tells us that they have Hashimoto. So frequently they don't know that they even have an autoimmune disease. They just thought they had low thyroid disease. And why would you say that is, Dr. Melinda, why do you think that these patients are often not being tested for the TPO antibodies? Yeah, so the, the thing that I've heard from both endocrinologists and what patients tell me that their primary care doctors or endocrinologists tell them is that because in the traditional world, they don't actually have a way to treat the Hashimoto's. So they figure, well, it doesn't really matter if we test for it because we don't actually have a way to treat it. And fortunately, naturopathic doctors, we have all kinds of ways to treat it because we, all the things that we've been sharing with you, you know, we have all these ideas and theories and we understand the triggers and we understand the inflammation. So we actually have a really great way of treating that. And, and that's why, that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we think it's really important to know if you do have an autoimmune disease. Thank you. So how do we test for Hashimoto's? Well, you know, typically in the allopathic system, they'll look at TSH, which is your thyroid stimulating hormone. It's the message from your brain to your thyroid that says, okay, make thyroid hormones. Uh, sometimes that can come back high. So it means that the brain is yelling at the thyroid and, and the thyroid is sort of underproducing. That free T4 and free T3 are the two specific uh, inactive and active thyroid hormones that the thyroid makes in response to this brain, uh, um, this, this brain yelling, yelling at it. If there are antibodies present, there's a couple that we look at, but anti-TPO is typically what we, what we look at. Those antibodies are, are sort of creating a local inflammatory response. The immune system is attacking the own, your own thyroid. So in general, you know, if the brain is yelling at the thyroid and the thyroid is putting out what it can, uh, it's typically, you know, lower than, than usual. So uh, a lot of people will come back with a hypothyroid state or a low thyroid state. Um, the instant we find those antibodies, we can make that diagnosis. Sometimes people are just in the autoimmune reactivity stage, and sometimes they're in the 
uh, autoimmune disease stage where we can truly say, yes, you have symptoms and these antibodies, you've got Hashimoto's. If there's inflammation, we can see that with a thyroid ultrasound. It's just a quick sort of scan of the thyroid that shows us whether there's fluid. Uh, you know, as physicians, your physician can also sort of palpate the thyroid and see, okay, is there a sort of a bogginess here? Is it larger than it should be? Uh, we could also look at salivary cortisol testing, which tells us about uh, the adrenal glands. And when your adrenal glands are putting out a lot of cortisol, you're, uh, it's actually suppressing your thyroid. So in naturopathic medicine, we're sort of looking at the whole body here. Uh, and, you know, we talked about the brain, we talked about the thyroid, we talked about the adrenals, we talked about the gut. There's so many things involved. So back to celiac disease, because that's another com more common one that you guys may be experiencing or have heard of. We want to just make mention that this is a little different than our standard barrier breach or what we would call intestinal permeability. This is a, a disease that causes the actual destruction of those tissues because the immune system is attacking those tissues around where the gluten is coming in. So we have damage of what we call the villi in the small intestine. And I like to liken these like gloves on a on fingers um, because these villi are increasing our surface area of our large intestine and for absorption of our nutrients. And when the villi are, have inflammation around them, they can become damaged. And then all of a sudden, our poor little colonocytes, those intestinal cells, uh, are wearing mittens and they're no longer able to absorb properly. So when we see progressed celiac disease, oftentimes there's significant body wasting and um, the inability to absorb nu nutrients properly. So unfortunately, this is a pretty high uh, amount. I've heard like one in 20 Americans, um, as, as high as that, I've seen that in the, in the studies, um, are experiencing some form of, of celiac disease. And then the other piece there is when we have that gluten, in no, that gluten autoimmunity, not just an intolerance, it's an actual autoimmunity, and we have those villi that have been attacked, we start having difficulty with breaking down our other proteins. And so I've also read that as many as one in five um, people with celiac disease are intolerant of dairy, for example, because once again, they cannot properly break down those, those proteins. So we'll just talk about testing real quick too. Okay, so standard blood test, um, frequently we would do that tissue transglutaminase, like what Dr. Molly was talking about. It's um, that component that's getting disrupted with the celiac as a way to kind of get an idea if this is happening. We also have genetic testing that we can do. There's um, quite a few HLA DQs that give us an idea of whether there's a, a gluten sensitivity um, genetically for you or not. And, and honestly, even if that's positive, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have that, you're going to have celiac. It just puts you at a predisposition to that. And there's all kinds of food antibody testing we were talking about, kind of like what Dr. Molly was talking about. Um, you know, if a patient is sensitive to gluten, they may also have a sensitivity to dairy. And then that, that issue of mimicry that she was talking about before, where, you know, the oat looks really similar to the wheat in a, in a molecule. So maybe, maybe you develop a sensitivity to oat as well because you're reacting to the wheat and all the other things that look like that. So the food antibody testing helps us to get a better understanding of exactly what you're reacting to. Briefly, the different types of antibody testing we can do with food. So IgE is that classic allergy. So if I eat the peanut, I get an anaphylactic reaction within minutes. That's what we call an IgE reaction. Um, usually patients will have a reaction within the hour if it's an IgE reaction. So some people already know what that is. And then some people, they do notice that they have reactions after food, but they're not exactly sure what it is. So that's why we would test. IgG is a reaction that can happen. It's called a delayed reaction. It can happen between two to three days after you've eaten a particular food. So it's actually really hard to figure out, you know, say you feel bad every few days, but you know, when you think about what you ate over the last three days, you know, it can be really hard to track down. I don't even know if I remember what I ate three days ago, um, more or less, you know, why I might be feeling bad. 
IgA is a very particular type of antibody that lives in our mucous membrane. So it's in our mouth and in our GI tract, and um, it, it usually reacts to specific um, inflammatory components that actually touch those mucous membranes. So when we look at all three of those different ways the body can react to food, it gives us a really good idea of, um, of all the different types of reactions you could be having. So if we're suspecting maybe an autoimmune thing going on or even just food intolerances, the proteins are the specific components of the foods that the body tags uh, as abnormal, especially when they go through the, the leaky gut. So sometimes we can do something known as an elimination rechallenge diet, where for three weeks or so you're removing the, the most common uh, in food intolerances, and those include gluten, those include dairy, your nightshades, which, you know, go from potatoes to tomatoes, uh, lectins, which are found in a lot of beans, uh, and then any cross-reactive grains. So sometimes, uh, you know, your oats can actually cross-react with your gluten proteins, or maybe they've been stored in a similar silo way up the food chain uh, and sort of are, can, can be cross-reactive for people. So removing those uh, can help us figure out if there is a food intolerance pers uh, perspective to this. And, you know, if the symptoms kind of go away during that time, that tells us a lot about the, the, the gut and, and potentially food uh, contributing to some of the, the pathologies and the symptoms that are being experienced. So one of our best uh, best things to try is, is an autoimmune paleo diet, uh, which sort of pulls away a lot of those typical culprit proteins. Blood sugar stabilization also helps because blood sugar, uh, increasing the blood sugar is quite inflammatory. And we talked about we want to dampen the inflammation here. Um, excess sodium will also, uh, you know, can also lead to, to some of the, these autoimmune sy symptoms as well. So just to go over common gluten grains to remind you guys, you probably know this, but remember it's not just wheat um, or rye, but it's also the spelt, the barley, the bulgur, the kamut, the durum. Around here we have um, local farmers that do, um, that make uh, farro and um, I believe some semolina as well. So there's several different ones. We think of couscous. Sometimes people forget that those that's essentially just like chopped up noodle. Um, but these are all going to be gluten grains. And remember, when we're talking about these proteins that can leak through, we know according to the medical literature that these are the most reactive to, for the immune system, the most reactive food triggers. So I, I um, we have this picture of pizza here because it's like the trifecta, right? It's got the gluten, it's got the dairy, it's got the nightshades with, with the, um, the tomato sauce. So those, unfortunately, can be very problematic. So we do want to either test and make sure that our autoimmune patients are not reacting to those or pull them out of our, their diet. The other piece I want to say there, because I know that I have um, several patients who are vegan or vegetarian, there are ways to do an autoimmune paleo style diet with not a lot of meat. You do not have to eat a ton of meat. That's not what this is about. It's more about removing those reactive proteins. Um, and you can have a very high veggie diet um, in regards to that and still get your proteins. So um, just briefly, I wanted to just um, tie in because I, I, I think this is assumed, but I just want to say it so it's 100% clear since we're talking about celiac disease. If you have celiac disease, then that means that whole list of things that include gluten, never, ever again. You should not ever have those foods again, not even a little bit. And I know that frequently when I diagnose patients with celiac, it takes them some time to fully grasp what that means in their diet. But any amount of those small amounts um, both eating them and putting them in products that are on your skin topically can create really big problems. So that's why we're going into depth about talking about them. And then um, Dr. Molly had that great chart of what is acceptable for, um, for grains that don't have gluten in them. And that includes the amaranth and the buckwheat. Corn is okay as long as you're not having a different reaction to corn with food sensitivities, millets. 
Um, they do have gluten-free um, oats and some of my patients who are celiac do great with gluten-free oats and some of my patients will still react to them. And, and you know, whether it's because they look similar on the molecular level or there's some other kind of contamination with transportation, it's not always clear. Rice, quinoa, teff, those are all great gluten-free grains that, um, that you should be able to eat. I think that's why ultimately for me, I will often have people reduce these foods, even though it can be really hard because I know they'll feel better. And according to the literature, it's not just celiac uh, patients with autoimmunity who need to be cautious about the um, the gluten. And my, my theory for that has to do with the intestinal permeability. But also I like to have people actually get tested because I want to know if they're having a molecular mimicry issue against something like their corn or their oats, um, for example, where they think they're doing all the right things and really starring those foods in their, in their meals, but they're actually potentially causing major immune imbalance. And technically, when you're doing a paleo type diet, that's already a low grain diet. So usually when we're talking about paleo, we're really focusing on the vegetables, like plates and plates and plates of vegetables with some protein and some fat. Mm -hmm. And those vegetables contain the antioxidants. So it's, you know, it's a double whammy. We're, we're decreasing the inflammation and we're, we're decreasing the potential uh, reactive proteins. So like Dr. Molly said, we're identifying the offend offending foods with a, with a blood test, see if there are, you know, any, if the body is reacting with an immune response to, to any of the foods, then we can remove them. Uh, we could do a trial of taking them out of the diet, uh, either one by one or, or, or more comprehensively. Uh, and we can also, in addition to that, do some things to reduce the inflammation. If there's less inflammation, the body's less stressed, it's able to heal better. Uh, we've got to also focus on the gut and make sure that there isn't a dysbiosis happening, uh, which is, you know, when you've got a monoculture of, of one of your uh, healthy, healthy uh, and happy pro, um, uh, not your probiotics, your, your microflora, there we go. And when there's too much of, of one, it's uh, creating an issue. So we've got to make sure there's a, a nice biodiversity and we can do that by re-inoculating with probiotics. We've got to repair that leaky gut and the mucosal lining. There's a lot of herbs that we can use that do this. Um, and then we've got to make sure digestion is happening uh, accurately and well. So sometimes we've got to add in some extra enzymes. Uh, the body, the, the stomach has maybe been so stressed and inflamed for a while that it's not producing enough of its own enzymes. And then we've got to make sure we're, we're keeping that, that nice, healthy system in balance. And so we're making sure that there's a healthy environment ongoing. Uh, so we've removed toxins, we've removed offending food intolerances uh, so that the body can remain free of, of local stress there. So once again, just a visual of repairing those layers. I like to think of it like a cake. So we've got those colonocytes, those intestinal cells that look like the blue cake here. And then we've got this glycosylated network of proteins that goes over the top. And we're going to talk about L-glutamine in particular here in a minute, and that helps with that. And then we have probiotics that sit on top of that. So we need our microflora there. It's one of our first barrier um, layers here. So we want to really replace this. And one of those tests we can do, it just sounds like a scientific uh, or a science fiction uh, fantasy name, but it's called zonulin. And that's these little um, basically barrier locks that go in between each of these blue colonocytes. And when those get cleaved, we have things that can come through. And so once again, we can do testing for that, which can be really helpful to know what um, to what degree the permeability is that's happening. So let's talk more about probiotics. So we know that probiotics are super important. We want to always support that good bacteria. Um, we know they're, they have roles in every single system in the entire body. The research on pro probiotics have really blown up in the last five years, and we just know that they're really crucial. We know that they're part of the immune regulation. We know that they're very specific in our um, gut-associated lymphatic tissue, which is um, in our GI tract, and it's 
It's the, the main immune part of what's in there. 70% um, of the immune system is in the GI tract. So that's going to be protecting the intestinal lining from other microbes, making sure to produce vitamin K, which is really important for our bone health. And then, you know, besides taking probiotics in a pill, we have all these kinds of lovely fermented foods where you can get probiotics. So um, yogurt, kefir, kimchi, kombucha, miso, tempeh, and um, raw sauerkraut, those are all really great for sources of getting probiotics on a regular basis. So since 70% of our immune system is in our gut, we've got to make sure that, you know, that first, uh, that first experience there with the immune system is, is healthy. And so we've got to make sure that the intestines are not stressed, not inflamed. And there's a lot of supplements we can use to help repair that leaky gut. Uh, this includes L-glutamine, something that's also found in your cabbage family. Zinc carnosine also helps close those, those leaky barriers. Uh, your vitamin B5, vitamin C, healthy fiber, cabbage juice, kind of going back up to the, the glutamine piece there. Aloe is going to decrease inflammation in the GI tract. So it sort of gives a nice uh, sort of cool coating to that, to that hot GI. And then flax and chia seeds also will, will help uh, specifically feed those cells. So when we're thinking about autoimmunity, one of the biggest pieces is I always need to let my patients know that you're gonna have some good days, we hope, and we're gonna have some bad days, potentially, because flares do happen. And my goal for my patients is to keep those flares at a minimum because we do not want the flares. When we are flaring, we are actively seeing tissue destruction. So ways that we can recover from the flares that do happen, because we know even if we're trying our best and going through getting rid of a lot of these triggers, we have the potential for stress to happen. We want to figure out ways to have a game plan for day one of them going into a flare if they're, it, and recognizing it when, when they do. So we want to be thinking about what's going on with lifestyle. If they're going into the flare, they need to immediately pull back and say, hey, what's going on? Am I really stressed? Where's the stress coming from? How can I manage it? They need to be looking very carefully at what they're eating during that time, especially really avoiding those food sensitivities. They need to be thinking, do I need extra supplementation at this point? And that's something that we work with individually with patients to give them the supplements that are going to help their specific autoimmune condition in regards to anti-inflammatory support. Um, and then as far as barrier recovery, we need to say, oh, is there a certain barrier that's involved with this, with this flare and how can we support that? And then we also really want to be thinking, is it appropriate for this person to be using something like the next level, which is pharmaceuticals? And for some of my patients, they've either come to me already on these pharmaceuticals or have gotten have progressed to the point when they're first seeing me that they need to be placed on pharmaceuticals. And that's where we're really usually getting a rheumatologist involved to help them be put on an immune suppressant. And I'm not going to pretend as a naturopath, naturopathic physician that we can cure autoimmunity um, or even that every autoimmune patient that comes in is going to have, you know, lollipops and rainbows like this is hard work, really hard work. And you need to be aware that you're going to have up days and harder days. So we want to prepare for that in advance and keep those down days as few as possible. But we also know that the lifestyle has to be addressed. If we just focus on the barrier, or if we just focus on immune suppression, or if we just focus on the symptoms, it's not going to be enough to actually keep those flares at bay. So we know that sleep, exercise, healthy relationships, managing stress. These are all things that are crucial. Um, and I would even say this is the same for all chronic diseases. Lifestyle must be addressed. And we've also got to address how the immune system is working. If it's too ramped up, we've got to downregulate it. So we do that by pulling out the irritants, like the food intolerances, like the, the high stress, uh, the high stress events, be it you know a, a, a difficult relationship or um, yeah physical stress even or environmental toxin stress, 
we've got to make sure there's a biodiversity of the microflora. Since like I mentioned earlier, we don't want a monoculture. That's not going to help us with our digestion. We want a gentle, you know, biodiversity of all of, all of those healthy guys. Um, and then we want to also make sure that uh, we, we get some glutathione, uh, which is a great antioxidant that uh, we can get from food or our body can create that reduces oxidative stress specifically to the barriers. And I know we've talked a lot about the gut barrier, um, but it also helps with, with the liver and the lung barriers as well. We often will also supplement glutathione because it is such a strong antioxidant. And we know, once again, according to the medical literature, that it is involved in just about every autoimmune process. It is, there's this recycling process that happens at the cellular level with glutathione. And it's, what it does is it, it helps reduce that oxidative stress, which can be involved in the damage, that process of the inflammation around those cells, which is causing the damage. So these are two of our favorite glutathione products that we utilize. So we have run out of time today. It's after one. So for those of you who need to leave, it's, it's, we understand that. But in general, if you have questions about this, if you're curious, if you have an autoimmune disease, if you have an autoimmune disease that hasn't been properly managed or you want to do some labs, you know, our, we are here for you. We are all very skilled and very knowledgeable about this, this, this concept. And we're happy to work with you and help you figure this out so that um, ultimately you can, you know, not be bothered by much by symptoms and be on a track to having better health. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to type that into the chat now and we will do our best. And then we also, while we're waiting for you guys to do that, if anyone does have questions, we want to invite you to our Doc Talk, our final one of the year, which is going to happen on the 8th of December. And that is going to be a really fun one because it's all about finding wellness, generalized supplementation and self-care that you can do for yourself. This is such a stressful time for so many of us. And so we really wanted to have a, a well-rounded approach to what, what things can you guys do right there at home for yourselves. Once again, this is going to be recorded, so feel free to go onto our website. That's prospernaturalhealth.com, and there's an area there that you can find these recorded doc talks under the education tab. And we look forward to hopefully talking to several of you in person and helping you figure out which barriers are involved, which triggers are involved, and what we can do to really support your immune response. So. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and log off for the day, and thank you all. Um, we had a lot of fun. <laughs>